Hello everyone and welcome to the last in our series of webinars for Introduction to Sociology, uh, SOCI 111, for the spring semester of 2015. Today we're going to be covering chapters 21, Collective Behavior and Social Movements, and 22, Social Change in a Global Community. So let me just get started here. And I must apologize to everybody uh, if you were in attendance prior to this. I've been struggling to get this to load on my computer for about half an hour now. So I do apologize to everybody for the delay. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 21, Collective Behavior and Social Movements. What are we going to be looking at? We'll examine theories of collective behavior, different forms of collective behavior, We'll examine social movements, communication and the globalization of social movements. We'll take a look specifically at disability rights. So what guides and governs collective behavior? Why do people participate in fads? What causes mass panics? How do new social movements spread their, messages, their message to others? Those are some of the questions we're going to be answering in this first chapter. Okay, so we've got a couple terms to define, collective behavior and social movement. We'll address social movements a little later in the chapter. Collective behavior, according to Neil Smelser, is relatively spontaneous and unstructured behavior of a group of people who are reacting to a common influence in an ambiguous situation. So collective behavior doesn't happen when everybody knows what to expect, like in the context of everybody showing up to go to a theater show or showing up at the movie theater or something like that. It has to be an ambiguous situation where people aren't sure exactly what's supposed to be going on. There are a lot of theories on this because it's difficult for sociologists to generalize about people's behavior in such fluid situations. Remember, in sociology, we're always trying to look for broad theories that we can and results that we can generalize to a population. This becomes difficult when we're looking at collective behavior because there's so many different ways to respond, um, so many different options. Now, the first one we're going to talk about is this idea of emer emergent norm perspective as a way of trying to explain collective behavior. During collective behavior, definition of what behavior is appropriate or not emerges from the crowd. So if we think about the riots, what we just saw in Baltimore recently and the sports riots of which there were 50 within the last year, um, you know, nobody thinks that protesting should incorporate elements of destruction, vandalism, and violence. These new norms of behavior emerge in the context of the fluid situation around a sporting event, around, like I said, a protest, things like that. It reflects shared convictions held by members of the group. Uh, if we think about Kentucky, Kentucky rioting uh, a couple months ago when their team lost in the playoffs, um, of course, Kentucky rioted when their team won, and then the Kentucky rioted when their team lost, too. Uh, but when you're out, um, the shared convictions are support of the team kind of thing. So there, it winds up becoming this, this kind of license for people to create new norms. There's a latitude for a wide range of acts within a general framework established by the emergent norm. So... The emergent norm might be to kind of get a little bit rowdier. People turn cars over, light fires, throw rocks through windows, um, get into fights, things like that. Now, the value-added model looks at it a little bit different because it talks about how broad social conditions are transformed in a definite pattern into some form of collective behavior. And some of the things that need to exist for the value-added model is structural conduciveness. There has to be the potential for collective behavior. The, the structure has to support the idea that people are allowed to kind of act. There has to be structural strain. Um, something in society is not serving members well enough. A generalized belief that this society should be 
be able to handle this particular situation. A precipitating factor and mobilization for action. So again, if we think about what happened in Baltimore, not just this weekend when we were talking, you know, this past weekend on Saturday and Monday when the riots happened, um, but the protests as well as another form of collective behavior. But structural conduciveness, okay, because we are allowed to gather in the United States of America. Structural strain, um, people believe that law enforcement is not treating black people the same as it's treating white people. A generalized belief that everybody should be treated equally by law enforcement in this country. Precipitating factor in the case of Baltimore would have been the death of Freddie Gray. And then mobilization for action where we began to see the protests happening. But this is also, this value-added model brought people together who are protesting, and then we can see how the emergent norm would explain how protests changed into riots. And then an exercise of social control at the very end. Police showing up in riot gear. Okay, the assembling perspective looks at people who are brought together who have a shared interest already. How, so it examines how and why people move from different points in space to a common location. And there are a couple of these that we can examine. Periodic assemblies, uh, work groups, college classes, sporting events, non-periodic assemblies, demonstrations, protests, parades, gatherings, um, what are referred to as the looky-loos, the people who watch fires and watch arrests happening. So it's looking at what draws people into these particular um, events, into the common location where these events take place. Okay, now we're going to start looking at some specific types of collective action. And we have crowd collective behavior and mass collective behavior. Crowd collective behavior is a set of collective behavior where it's defined kind of by face-to-face -face interaction. Mass collective behavior takes place um, without geographic proximity. So the first thing is a crowd. Temporary groupings of people in close, close proximity who share a common focus or interest. It's not totally lacking in structure and even during riots Participants are governed by identifiable social norms and exhibit definite patterns of behavior. Um, so we riot, protest, sporting event. It's that shared focus that brings people together. Um, and then emergent norm perspective would suggest that a new social norm is accepted by members of the crowd. And this takes on new meaning with the Internet um, in that when something goes viral, it can be said to be creating kind of a crowd who share interest in that particular topic, even though they're separated geographically. It does bring them in a virtual sense into a close proximity. Disasters, natural disasters or other types of disasters, sudden or disruptive event or events that overtaxes communities' resources requiring outside aid. So any time you have a disaster level event when the community's own resources are not sufficient to meet the challenge. Uh, so there are people that do research into disaster behaviors uh, and the behaviors that exhibit or emerge. There's a disaster research center at the University of Delaware. And Things that, you know, constitute a disaster, of course, earthquake, hurricane, all these kind of things. Um, but there can be other types of, like, power outages can create disaster conditions. Um, and so the Disaster Research, is research Center at the University of Delaware uh, is responsible for developing planning for established health care in emergency, rumor control and mental health centers, um, and disaster preparedness emergency response programs. Now, we've got these two kind of things that are still kind of collective behavior but don't really involve um, large numbers of people gathering in one place. We have fads and fashions. Uh, fads, temporary patterns of behavior involving large numbers of people. 
fashions or pleasurable mass involvements that feature acceptance by society and historical continuity. Um, now, of course, we can talk about fads and fashion and clothing, um, and that's what most people would think of, but there are also fads and fashions in food, in toys, in home decor. All different kinds of area of culture will have fads and fashion in them, even if you think about like hairstyles, music, um, literature. Think about how a few years ago it seemed like everybody was wanting to produce vampire related and vampires have become a fad um, and then zombies are now the new kind of fad um, the difference between fads and fashions is that fads seem to kind of spring up without historical antecedents at that level fashions have a sort of sense of historical continuity to them and fads and fashion both allow people to identify with something different from dominant institutions and symbols of a culture. Um, think about like hairstyles, like uh, the changes that come across in hairstyles. Right now, um, it seems like beards are coming back into fashion. Um, a lot more people are wearing beards and long beards, not just scruff, but long beards. A craze. Exciting mass involvement, and when it says mass involvement, it's something that's more dispersed that lasts for a relatively long period. A panic is fearful arousal or collective flight based on a generalized belief that may or may not be accurate. The difference between a panic and a riot is a panic can be dispersed. Think about the uh, fear of anthrax in letters that happened a number of years ago. Um, may or may not be accurate, but crazes are a little bit different like raves are an example of craze, a craze, or breakdancing is an example of a craze. So when we think about this, crazes are moving to something, panics are flight from something, and that's how kind of they differ. Rumor, um, information gathered informally to interpret an uh, ambiguous situation. Rumors don't necessarily have to be true. Uh, it's just information that people use to try and understand uh, what's going on in a particular situation. So it provides a group with a shared belief. Um, there's a means of adapting to change. And they reinforce people's ideology and suspicion of mass media. Um, gossip is a specific type of rumor that involves information about people. So we've got a public then, a dispersed group of people not necessarily in contact with one another who share an interest in an issue. Public opinion, expression or attitudes on matters of public policy uh, that are communicated to decision makers. Signing a petition is creating public opinion. Circulating a petition is creating public opinion. Uh, and for each particular uh, petition that may get started, you will have a public involved in that particular issue. This is where we see a lot of polling and survey, because the, the polls and surveys reveal the attitudes, the interests, the values of the public. Um, and so when we do like something like uh, census data, one of the reasons they want to gather all that kind of stuff is um, it gives them this idea of how our population is broken down. Um, and sometimes in the census they will ask, uh, political affiliation, things like that. Now, I told you social movements are a specific type of collective behavior. It's organized collective behavior, uh, organized to bring about or resist change in a group or a society. Um, and if you think about, like, social movements, you'll usually find social movements on both sides of an issue. They may not be recognized at the same level, uh, but the social movements do have, like if we think about uh, same-sex marriage, there are people opposing it and people supporting it. There are social movements and uh, advocacy organizations on both sides of the issue. Same thing with um, abortion rights. There are people that want the abortion rights to stay. There are people that want to eliminate right to abortion. Um, so some of the people are resisting change. Others are trying to bring it about. And they've had a dramatic impact on the course of history and evolution of social structure. Think about the suffrage movement. That changed the political landscape because it extended voting rights to over half our population by allowing women to vote. And this started as a social movement. 
Functionalists look at social movements as contributing to the formation of a, a public opinion. Um, and increasingly, they're taking on an international dimension. If you think about something like Amnesty International, it is a human rights organization that operates in a number of different countries around the world. So when we think about social movements, we have specific theories to try to explain how social movements as a specific type of collective behavior begin um, and how they uh, progress and how they exist and how they achieve their goals. So we have relative deprivation, which is one approach to explaining social movements. And it's a conscious feeling of negative discrepancies between legitimate expectations and present actuality. All people are created equal, and every person in the United States of America has the right, inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The civil rights movement, the equal rights movement, the suffrage movement can all be interpreted using relative deprivation theory because of the discrepancy between legitimate expectations, everybody should be able to participate, everybody should have the same rights, and present actualities where people were restricted from full participation on a social, economic, and political scale. Now, social movements emerge. They go through four stages, emergence, coalescence, routinization, and finally decline. Before discontent is channeled into a social movement, people have to feel a few things. First of all, they have to feel that they have a right to the, the goals, uh, and they perceive that they cannot attain goals through conventional means. Uh, with regards to the civil rights movement, um, this goes back into the Reconstruction period when you had Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois both advocating different ways of achieving equality. Booker T. Washington believed in what he called his politics of accommodation, which said that if we just go along and keep our heads down, eventually they'll recognize that we're working hard and they'll grant us equality. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois had the perception that they would never achieve their goals that way. Um, and so this is how uh, he founded kind of the Niagara Movement, which eventually became the NAACP, another advocacy organization to try and provide education to African Americans. Now, resource mobilization theory is, uh, looks at uh, how a social movement effectively mobilizes resources. And there are kind of four different types of resources that people broadly think of. There's money, there's space, there's media, and there's people. And all of these have to be effectively mobilized in order for a social movement to have any chance of success, according to resource mobilization theory. Now, politics, that's actually mobilizing people because you need to get support from politicians in the same way that you need to get support from everything else. Um, and political influence does become important, um, but really... The initial four goals would be money, media, workers, and space. The social movement needs a space in which to exist. It needs to have positive coverage in the media. It needs economic resources, and it needs workers. Now, Obershaw believed that to sustain a social movement, there must be an organizational base and a continuity of leadership. If we take resource mobilization theory and examine the Occupy movement, we can see that part of where it's stalled is it hasn't effectively mobilized either the media or workers to create the organizational base and continuity of leadership. Occupy Wall Street is still going on as a social movement. It just never really gets effective coverage in the media. Now, Marx talked about his idea of false consciousness. Now, false consciousness is the idea that... Uh, the interests of the workers align with the interests of the owners. Uh, Marx believed that this was never the case, and he believed that when workers did feel that their interests aligned with the owners, the owners had managed to create false consciousness in the workers. And leaders would need to help workers overcome this false consciousness so that they could look at their position objectively and see how all workers share the same kind of objective position, but that position is not the one that is provided to them by false consciousness. Um, 
tax breaks do not benefit anybody in the country making less than $200,000 a year. They only benefit people making more than that amount. And the, the argument behind that is, is that tax breaks um, kind of reduce the amount of money the government has to provide services. And if we had kept the tax code as it was, in fact, if the elites even paid just at the top tax rate of 35%, and we're not even talking about capital gains and stuff like that, that you go ab above when you hit certain levels of income. But even if we just said at 35%, the, the government would have a lot more money to work with, and then that money provides social, provides infrastructure repair, provides social services and safety nets to the people who um, are middle class and below. So Marx would look at the idea that corporate leaders have convinced politicians in the United States of America and politicians representing the interests of the people, but convinced them that tax breaks are beneficial for everybody in the economy. That's an example of creating false consciousness. Now, when we talk about social movements, gender does play into this in kind of an interesting way. Uh, first of all, most of the leaders of social movements tend to be men. Women find it more difficult to assume leadership positions uh, than men do in social movement organizations. Despite this, um, women tend to volunteer at a higher rate for nonprofits and for social movements. But gender can affect the way we view organized efforts to bring about or resist change as well. So we have to look at social movements through feminist lens as well, examining, you know, like if we think about something like uh, the abortion issue, why do we see one of the things that feminists would want to investigate with that particular social movements on either side of the abortion issue, why do we see more female leaders on the pro-choice side and more male leaders on the pro-life side? That would be one thing that we could kind of try to discuss using gender to examine a social movement. Now, new social movements are social movements, they're organized collect collective activities uh, that promote autonomy, self-determination, and improved quality of life. They may address philosophical or ethical issues like PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. That is a new social movement. Um, and it's about um, improving our ethical treatment of animals. In general, new social movements do not view government as their ally. Um, and if you ever watch anything about the people who are members of PETA, you will see that they kind of exhibit this, show little inclination to accept established authority. Um, we find the same kind of thing with Occupy Wall Street as well as a new social movement. Although, really, Occupy Wall Street is more about resource uh, relative deprivation. Um, if you, it's a very Marxian social movement that's about wealth redistribution, um, really, because it talks about the the one percent, the two percent, uh, who control eighty five percent of the wealth in this country. Communication, of course, facilitates collective behavior. Um, Text messaging and the Internet allow social activists to reach people instantaneously. We can see examples of this in what's called flash mobs. Uh, if flash mobs can organize that way, other social movements um, and types of collective behavior can organize as well. Listservs and chat rooms allow organizers to um, enlist like-minded people, and they can actually have a discussion without the necessity of face-to-face -face contact. Um, However, television and the Internet can convey a false sense of intimacy because of that immediacy. Um, you may join a social movement and think that it's doing great work and, and really want to move forward with it um, and feel like you're part of a group of like-minded people, uh, but sometimes that sense of intimacy can be a little bit false. Uh, it's what we refer to as computer-mediated communication and instant messaging um, through, you know, Blackboard's got an instant messenger, but Facebook has an instant messenger. There are all kinds of instant messengers. Uh, email. These are all sort of computer-mediated communication. 
even text messaging and um, Twitter, uh, Instagram, all these kind of things, if you're doing them on your smartphone, you're just doing them on a small handheld computer anymore. Okay, so taking a look at disability, um, disability is a social movement. The, the name for the social movement is actually accessibility because disabled people feel like that's the big issue. The way that they are kind of alienated from society and disenfranchised is, is that they do not have access to participate fully in society in the way that people without disabilities do. Mobility, hearing, speaking, seeing, um, all of these are issues in disability uh, and we also have uh, issues with mental challenges as well. So when we think about what used to be called retardation, uh, but having me being mentally challenged um, or physically challenged, whether it's a mobility, vision, hearing, um, maybe speech, um, all of this falls under the rubric of disability. And so the social movement is oriented around trying to ensure health and rights of people with disabilities. And this has grown steadily since the early 1960s. One of the ways is challenging stereo negative stereotypes um, that exist, creating advocacy groups to try to uh, increase agency in public, in public policy decisions that may affect them. They have lobbyists in Washington and at the state level as well. And they're trying to reshape laws, institutions, and environments. Laws basically saying that um, the, the society needs to make allowances so that these people are able to participate fully. Institutions, education, we of course observe the ADA Act, but we think about the economy. Sometimes it's very hard for people with disabilities to find work. Um, nobody's willing to give them a chance, even, be, even if they have other abilities, maybe at a higher level than anybody else applying for the job, because disability becomes a master status and people become viewed just through that disability lens. Environments, this has to do with the issue of accessibility. Um, so right now, Businesses and government institutions, government buildings, are required to be accessible to people with mobility issues. That's not the case with private homes or private apartments. Um, in fact, apartment complexes, as long as they have one or two uh, that are handicapped accessible, they've satisfied the law. Um, but accessibility really is about making every house accessible to um, people with mobility issues. And the reason for that is that you shouldn't have to pay extra or have a special house built simply because uh, you have a mobility issue. So this is the whole disability rights. Um, something else that does become problematic Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my microphone here. So, um, many disabilities, um, despite the fact that it becomes a master status, uh, many of them are not recognized as a disability status. So, in 1990, the government passed the ADA Act. It has since been kind of renewed, but it's the American with Disabilities Act. And this is the civil rights bill for people who uh, have disabilities. It prohibits bias against people with disabilities in employment, transportation, public accommodations, and telecommunication. Um, notice it doesn't really say much in there about private, uh, like home if you're in a wheelchair, my house is very difficult to visit because there's stairs to get into the house. The house sits up on a foundation. 
It defines disability as a condition that substantially limits a major life activity. Seeing, hearing, speaking, moving, thinking. Um, and responsibility for enforcement was given to several federal agencies. So when we think about this, being labeled as a minority becomes a mass, or uh, as disabled becomes a master status. So when we think about the labeling perspective, remember that's about applying an external labor, label. Um, and so the way that people tend to think about the ADA Act is that it frames it as the issue of disability rights, um, which is good because other nations still continue to see it as an entitlement issue. Conflict theorists, this is just another group that's been disenfranchised and alienated from society, and they're just trying to gain equal access. So ADA is just part of a 40-year civil rights movement. <clears throat> And interaction is focused on everyday relationships of people with and without disabilities. How does the disability play into the way that people interact, uh, people without disabilities interacting with people with disabilities? Um, so a lot of the social movements around disability and accessibility believe that the federal agencies are too cautious in, in enforcing the, dis, uh, the ADA. And like I said, it's about accessibility. So disability rights activists are questioning visitability. Now, this is the ability of people with mobility issues to visit the homes, private homes. Um, like I said, if somebody with a mobility issue wanted to visit my home, it would be problematic because it's built up on a foundation, and so there are stairs to get into any of the doors that lead into the house. That, of course, concludes looking at Chapter 21. Now we're going to move on to Chapter 22. which is social change in the global community. Some of the issues we'll be looking at, we'll be examining theories of social change, resistance to social change, uh, social change on a global scale, how is technology changing. We'll take a look at the idea of what transnationals are. So how does social change happen? Is the process unpredictable or can we make generalizations about it? Has globalization contributed to social change? Those are some of the questions we're going to be looking at. And the only thing that we can say is constant about social change is it's always going on. A significant alteration over time in behavior patterns and culture, values, attitudes. Um, these things change over time. And so we cannot say that something that was a value in 1950 remains a value in 2015. Now, it began looking at this with the idea that societies evolve. They move in definite directions. Um, this was a view that placed industrialized societies kind of at the pinnacle, and any society that wasn't industrialized was a society that was not as evolved. We've got the functionalist theory looking at social, uh, the equilibrium model. Um, and this basically says that once a change happens in one part of society, other parts of society need to react in order to keep society existing in a, an equilibrium, a state of equilibrium, which would be social stability. Talcott Parsons, if you remember from our discussion on health and medicine, um, who gave us the idea of the sick role, was another functionalist, and he talked about four processes of social change. Differentiation, adaptive upgrading, inclusion, and value generalization. And these are the four processes that take part as part of social change. Differentiation between uh, people as they learn new jobs in an expanding division of labor. Adaptive upgrading, Inclusion, of course, um, 
trying to make sure that everybody, you know, everybody's a fun member of society and so everybody belongs in there. And then value generalization, which is where we take the values. If you remember, value is what's defined as right and good and proper in a society. Now, we kind of take that and generalize about the changes that are happening in society. Conflict theory looks at social change um, as needed to bring about equality. It corrects social injustices and inequality. Um, the Marxist view of social change appeals because it puts people um, as actors. It does not restrict people to passive roles in the same way that we think about like this one. Um, this is all kind of going on passively. People are just uh, doing their thing in society as society changes. So when we think about this, um, the proletariat rising up and overthrowing the bourgeoisie, that's an active role in society. And Dahrendorf uh, made a synthesis that found that functionalism and conflict, these two approaches, were fine. They were compatible uh, in as far as examining social change. Now, when we think about resistance to social change, um, and social change can be something brought about by a social movement. It can be brought about by technological, technological innovation. It can be brought about by uh, policy changes, all this kind of stuff. But usually there will be some resistance to social change. Um, when you hear people hearkening back to traditional family values, they're talking about how the family as an institution has changed in a way that they do not feel is beneficial for society. Um, and maybe it's because they have a vested interest in family existing in that form. But um, efforts to promote social change are likely to meet re with resistance from people who have vested interests in maintaining the status quo. Um, suffer, they may lose something. It might not be actual true suffering, but um, people who would be disadvantaged because of social change. A cultural factor is like uh, when your non-material culture may not be on a par with new material conditions, and this creates cultural lag. Uh, that period of maladjustance when non-material culture is struggling to adapt to new material conditions. You think about like uh, Pippa and Sopa as two acts of Congress. Uh, Pippa's Protect Intellectual Property Act and Sopa is Stop Online Piracy Act. Uh, these are where society is trying to figure out how to deal with, still trying to figure out how to deal with the computer and internet because it makes it so much easier to download and steal a movie or music or something like that. And so we're still trying to figure out how to deal with this. Uh, technology, as people uh, come up with new ways of using resources, to satisfy needs and desires, it creates new technological and new material conditions. Um, resistance to industrial revolution, um, the Luddites, founded by Carl Ludd, um, these were actually the workers, if there are any Star Trek fan, fans out there, the workers who flung their shoes called Sabo, wooden shoes called Sabo, into the gears of the industrialized machinery. Um, hence the word sabotage, but the whole idea behind Carl Ludd was he saw this uh, mechanization as eliminating people's jobs, and so uh, he and others who followed him resisted industrial revolution um, because they realized that it was going to change the nature of what work meant. And there are people who resisted the post-industrial expansion of industrialization as well. Um, people who said, I, I, you know, I don't want to learn to use a computer. I'm happy to do things the old way. I don't want to, you know, I don't need a smartphone. A cell phone's fine. You know, the people who kind of resist new technology. But social change uh, is, so, like I said, the only constant about it is that it's constantly going on. So it doesn't always follow a period of internal disintegration. Um, if we think about what's going on globally right now, um, and think about the global social change. Um, 
sociology actually does have something to say about this. Randall Collins, who's a functionalist sociologist, actually predicted coincidence of social crises would collapse the Soviet Union. Which is pretty much how it played out. Um, but that's one of the things that sociologists try to do is they try to examine what's going on and predict upheavals and major chaotic shifts. And so if we think about what's going on, we need to look at how society is changing and try to make predictions about upheavals and major chaotic shifts that will be created because of the change going on. Um, technology, of course, has brought striking changes to culture, patterns of socialization, social institutions, and day-to-day -day social interactions. Just start with the cell phone. Let's not even talk about the smartphone and texting and everything else. But when cell phones started becoming widely available to everybody, all of a sudden, it began changing the way we interacted on a day-to-day -day basis. Calling and leaving a message, um, if somebody didn't call you back within a few minutes, you began to wonder if something was wrong or if they were just ignoring you. Because in the age of cell phones, we should all be instantly accessible. Now, of course, if we have class and things like that, everybody kind of understands that there are periods. But if you know somebody's at home and you call them and they're not answering their cell phone, um, our basic way that we interact with the phone has changed because we expect people to be available almost 24-7. Um, patterns of socialization, social institutions. You're taking a class at Ivy Tech in a way that is new, relatively new, which is you're taking it in a virtual setting. You're taking an online class. You don't actually go and attend class. So it's brought a lot of change. Technology has brought a lot of change. Computers, automobiles, train. If you think about any major innovation, it changes society and then, to a certain extent, creates a period of culture lag where society has to catch up. When automobiles first hit the roads, there weren't any kind of traffic. There was no decision about traffic laws, traffic signs. Um, even driving on the right side of the road wasn't something that was widely recognized. All that became necessary when um, our non-material behaviors were struggling to catch up with those new material conditions. And so we had to adapt. Okay. In 2010, the Internet reached 1.8 billion users, and that number has continued to grow. So we're thinking that's roughly um, uh, what would that be, about an eighth, seventh or eighth of the population um, of the planet. Not everybody has access, um, and oftentimes the access is determined by not so much um, the level of affluence of the individual, but the level of affluence of the society in which the individual lives. Because even if you're the richest person in certain nations, the infrastructure is just not there to provide the Internet in the same way that it is here in the United States of America. Remember Emanuel Wallerstein's world systems analysis, if we talk about the core, semi-periphery, and periphery, the core nations have a monopoly on information technology. Um, the 1.8 billion users throughout the world are usually uh, the middle and upper class and for the most part they're concentrated in the higher income nations of the world. Something else we have to consider that's causing change, biotechnology and the gene pool. Um, and again, these are creating ethical issues that people are engaged in debate over currently. Um, because right now we can predetermine the sex of our child, you know, the fetus, hair color, eye color, we have GMOs, cloning of sheep, cows, and animals, all these are significant advances. Now, if we keep playing this out, what happens if I decide um, when I'm 20 years of age to create a clone of myself, keep it brain dead, so that as I grow older, there'll be a fresh supply of organs for me to harvest to replace organs in my body that fail. Is that ethical? Potentially it's possible right now. Is it ethical? Mm, there's the big question. 
But what some of the things this does is it extends the medicalization of society. <clears throat> um, essentially, when something becomes medicalized, remember our discussion of health and medicine, it restricts to the people who can actually treat it. Um, it can altering human behavior through genetic engineering. We're getting back to the ideas in eugenics uh, that people can be. Um, well, in eugenics, it was breeding for traits in and out. But with altering DNA, we can alter behaviors in and out. So we can alter human behavior through genetic engineering. Does that mean it's perfectly acceptable to complete to create a compliant workforce? Um, so that the only people who would really have what we think of when we say free will is uh, the elites in society. And of course, genetically modified food, there is, there's more of an issue with this in Europe than there is in the United States of America, although there is a social movement that's emerged around GMOs, um, specifically with like labeling. People would at least like to know if they're eating genetically modified food. In most European countries, that's what you have to do. They have to be labeled. And then the Human Genome Project, which is devoted to mapping the entirety of the human genome. Um, and as we identify more and more genes and what they do, this gives us the, the potential to significantly alter um, a human's genetic makeup. And then again, this becomes something that, that is, has all kinds of ethical questions. So we can alter behavior or even physical traits. Um, suppose we discover the trait for the, the gene for muscle growth, and we can trigger that gene so that people can become much, much stronger without steroids. Is there a way that this becomes unethical with regards to competition in sports then? So biotechnology needs constant monitoring, um, but there are positives as well. We could eliminate diabetes, which is a genetic condition, type 1 diabetes, which is a genetic condition. We can eliminate MS. We can eliminate scoliosis, all kinds of things. Um, genetically modified food enables us to give food to more people, to feed more of the people on the planet. Um, but is there damage that can, is potential damage to be done to the environment um, when we think about this as well? Okay, finally we get to this issue of transnationals. Um, this is another way society is changing. People who were um, essentially have networks in more than one nation state. So when we think about people migrating, leaving home in search of a better life by filling jobs where there is shortage in the labor market in other nations, host countries often react negatively to the migrants' arrival. Uh, but that tends to be with regards to mostly unskilled labor, not necessarily skilled labor in the professions, the trades, things like that. Um, but they do react negatively to the migrants' arrival. And then the transnationals are the ones who develop new relationships in the uh, society to which they've come looking for work, and also relationships and networks in the society from which they came. So they're actually linking, they're creating a network that spans two nation states and crosses an international border. So when we think about what's going on here, we've got our three kind of approaches. Functionalists, um, really they view immigration beneficially from the functionalist perspective because this is the way that economies are able to make sure that all jobs are taken care of within a particular society. So this maximizes human labor. Um, conflict theorists look at it as not so beneficial simply because globalization increases gulf between developed and developing nations. Um, but transnationals are kind of a phenomenon of a global society. And then Interactionists would study, again, we're looking at meetings at the individual level, so they'd study transnationalist involvement in local ethnic organizations to see whether membership facilitates or retards their integration into the host society. If you remember, we talked about the, the paradox of maintaining ethnic identity uh, back in the, one of the earlier chapters. Um, 
anyway, the idea of maintaining, paradox of maintaining ethnic identity is that oftentimes when you move to a new nation, there will be an enclave of immigrants from your original society. And by maintaining your ethnicity um, and becoming part of that enclave, it actually facilitates easier assimilation into the new society. And so this would be something an interactionist would examine. And then when we think about policies, uh, immigrant laborers often face difficult li living and working conditions. Voter eligibility is an issue. Um, and public attitudes and government policies have not kept pace with easy, increasing ease of migration. Um, here in the United States of America, you know, everybody says, well, if they want to come to this country, why don't they just do it legally? All they have to do is get in line. But what nobody fails to understand is there's no line for unskilled immigrants coming from Latin America into this country. There's no number, there are no uh, unskilled laborers allowed to come across the border from Mexico to the United States of America. There's no line for them to get into. And so it, it tends to ignore a little bit of like the economic realities. Our nation relies on immigrant labor for pricing. So, okay, this concludes the last lecture for Spring 2015 Introduction to Sociology online class. Um, during the summer, this will be on hiatus, and then in the fall, um, we'll be trying to expand and continue this program, so be sure to look for uh, statewide synchronous sessions in many of the other courses you can take here at Ivy Tech. As always, if you have questions, you can feel free to email me with them. mhowell1 at ivytech.edu. That's 